Welcome to Top M&A Entrepreneurs. Today, my guest is Jordan Evans, an accidental roll-up entrepreneur. Jordan bought his family's 30-year-old six-figure lifestyle language business and turned a seemingly overpriced investment into a powerhouse through strategic acquisitions. I asked Jordan how he navigated through this fragmented language service sector, about all the deals he won and lost, and just a few years later, driving exponential growth, both in revenue and profits doubling every year. Well, welcome to the show, Jordan. How are things going? I uh, cannot complain. Uh, it's good to be alive and uh, excited to be on the show with you. All right. Thanks. So let's talk about this journey that you acquired your company from your parents. You told me you paid too much, but let's mm -hmm. kind of rewind and go, what were you doing before then? And how did you like, ah, you know, parents want to sell it. Like, should I buy it? You know, that whole story there. Yeah, I, I think the narrative story is uh, uh, a good one to go the the arc. And I think in some ways my story is typical and others atypical. Uh, I think what's typical is that I had a W-2. I worked for somebody else. I was uh, in software startups before. Um, what's atypical about that is it was startups. So you're building something from scratch. And I was always on the sales and marketing side. So yeah. before jumping into entrepreneurship and buying this business, uh, I was having a lot of fun, had a lot of misses. Um, I had a, a lot of failures on my own, which I tease, I should add to my LinkedIn too. Uh, just a daily deals site um, for the Hispanic population when Groupon was getting started, a SaaS you know, project management solution. Like there were just so many misses in my journey that are not accounted for. So yeah. I just wanted to put that out there is like um, when we dive into, I feel like now I got traction and success buying businesses that there were a lot of lessons along the way and banging your head against the wall to get here. Um, but the, the short of it is I always knew I wanted to work for myself and have my own thing. I always thought you had to start as a startup, you know, build something from scratch. Um, I had that same disease. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's curable though. It's curable. Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, I think what's interesting for the listeners is, um, you know, I was always looking at earning and learning at the same time that if you right. are going to go get a W2 and get paid, like get paid more than what's going to pay the bills, be getting the skills that you need uh, to be an entrepreneur or business owner, if, if that's your aspiration. So uh, don't miss an opportunity. Self-teach yourself, but also like optimize for roles or companies where you're going to get that real world MBA. Yeah, yeah. It, it, insert yourself into that. Test your, test your capacities, like to push yourself to limits, like what you can learn. Like if you don't know something, be curious about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or optimize for companies, which my instance was software companies or startups where there is no career path per se. It's like if you see a need or opportunity and you raise your hand and you come up with a plan and can execute, it's just it's a great place to experiment. And yeah, uh, it's less permission based. It's like, hey, I see. Uh, so it's kind of a way to still have a W-2 and be entrepreneurial. Yeah. Um, so. You asked, what did I do before that? I studied economics and business. What do you freaking do? Who needs a college education these days? I mean, everything's online. You could teach yourself, but um, whatever. I bought into it. I met my wife there. Everything's good. I have no complaints. Um, but I'm not using any of it today. Um, right. And so, so, you know, I respect people that get an education, uh, but I think in today's world, owning a business, it's less important. Um, I think if I could highlight anything, maybe I'm going off track. You get me on track if I am, John. No, 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 it, no. I, I look. I drive my kids to uh, uh, high school, and we pass by the University of Arizona, and they've just seen these kids pay sixty thousand a year. Going, yeah, I'm not really sure that's a good mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you could just wait for somebody like Biden to say, you know what, I'm going to get you out of your debt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Somebody else is going to fix your problem. But I mean, yeah. that's not why we're here or I don't think your audience is here too. It's like, yeah. we want to take charge of our destiny. We want to 
uh, be rewarded for the risk and, and the opportunities that we seize. Uh, so I, there's definitely a place. I hire a lot of highly educated people that went through the school system. So it serves a purpose, right? Uh, so let's fast forward to the moment, maybe, you know, getting into M&A. And yeah. it was around 2016 thereabouts. My ass was fired. Can I curse on the show? I'll, I'll censor myself. You can. Not... Right. Okay. I don't know if ass is a uh, profanity. It's called okay. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it just adds um, some flavor to our conversation. But um, I'll I'll keep it PG thirteen. How about that? Um, I I was fired. I was let go by my CEO. I was a VP of Sales and Marketing at an early stage startup, just coming off of success of a startup before that that was acquired by Booking dot com. I was a commercial director for their entire sales force in North America, and uh, so major uh highlight of my career then to a really shitty uh stressful uh time at a startup and that was a kick in the pants of like you've been wanting to do your own thing and be your own boss and now here's the universe sending you the sign of like don't be a mercenary for anybody else anymore and so that really started the looking around and saying well what can i do um at that time, I had the fortunate uh, benefit of having family that had this translation company, and it was lifestyle business, four people, $700,000 in revenue, and it was mom and dad, and they were burnt out after 30 years. No, 30 no years? Exit plan. 30 years, yes. Yeah, and it was nice profitability. Uh, obviously, it was looked Great cash know. flow, yeah. Great cash it, flow. Yeah, good good margins, uh, good repeating business, like uh, clients reoccur. It's not contracted, but the needs keep arising. We're talking uh, language services, which is spoken words. So think of a hospital that services a community in L.A., and they've got you know, nine different languages that people come into the ER. They need to work with them in. So it's yeah. repeating. Uh, then you can think about international businesses. They don't start and stop doing business in different international markets. They need to translate marketing and support material and websites. And so it, it's a nice niche industry that I can't take any credit for finding. It was kind of there in front of me. That's no, I actually applied for a, a director of business development for a local language company here in Tucson. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, this ah. is a long time ago. Like Sir Siricom? Yes. Do you remember? Siricom. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're a big player in our space. <clears throat> yeah. That's very cool. And they do OPI, which is over the phone interpreting, a lot of interpretation. Um, and now it's a lot of video remote telehealth as well. Yeah, so we for definitely that. for hospital. They, you know, mm -hmm. big contracts were UMC and uh, Banner. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So it's, it's that moment where, uh, you know, I was in the right place and I saw an opportunity. I could use my sales and startup skills to grow this lifestyle business and figure out how to retire them at the same time. And I didn't know you could buy a business before, never thought of it before. And this was that revelation moment that uh, I'm one of five kids. I don't want anyone coming down the road saying, hey, where's my inheritance after I scale this thing up? So the best way to do that is buy the business. So I, I figured that out. And at that time, it was like the, the HBR book on uh, how uh, to buy perfect. a small yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. That was it. And, and talking to attorneys and, you know, Googling, it just, it wasn't the same level of resource and community around search and business acquisition that we have today in 2024. Uh, it's accelerating the, the amount of information mm -hmm. and the people mm -hmm. sharing what they've learned in the I last five it. years. Yeah. 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 It's so awesome to share and, and put that out there and help other people do it. Cause it's, it is a, a rising tide floats all boats situation, I believe. Sure, we might be bidding on on deals similarly, but I don't even think it's it's that it's so fragmented. S and yeah. acquisitions. It's it's not a it's not an easy thing. Just let's just say it. Like most mm -hmm. people that try, you know, fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, when did the uh, you have this conversation? Did the parents think about going? You know what I want. Were they thinking about closing it down or were they thinking about going through a broker or? No, I mean, they're just so heads down that they didn't see the exit 
sign. They didn't you know, realize that that was an option even. I think they just thought they'd run it till they were tired and done and, and shut it down, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's the ideal situation. There was paper involved. Um, there's recurring. Um, what I'm saying, the ideal situation was uh, this small business that in spite of the owners being passionate or like burnt out or not, is still running and still has that repeat base. And it had a lot of hair on it, meaning like inefficient processes, things that you can modernize and and improve the cash flow ultimately. Um, so I, technology I, and software, oh, yes. yeah, hundred percent that they weren't aware of just because they kept doing the same thing. You know, 100%. it's the way we do it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You you get later on, it's producing enough cash flow for you. You just why bother try and learn a new system or reinvent yeah. the wheel? So. There's a lot of these companies out there, maybe a little bit less than six, seven, eight years ago. But um, I salivate when I see a company that's <laughs> got some sort of paper involved in the process and they haven't touched this pricing sheet in like two decades. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I so, have to ask you, you know, you have uh, other family members. Did they... As soon as you kind of came to the realization, well, I should buy it from them, didn't they have some kind of obligation to sit everybody down and go, well, I have the obligation to offer it to the other family members to purchase? It's kind of like in the contract of kids. Like, how yeah, that good go? question. I guess every family's different. Fortunately, it, it, I think it worked the best that it, that it could, um, and and then some. Um, yeah, I was the only one showing up with willing to pony up and and write him a check and and sign up for working in the business. Yeah. So it, it wasn't a formal meeting or right of a first refusal. It, it was a like I I I don't have to buy this company, but I'm willing to. And you know, here's the price that I'm willing to pay and how we'd structure it. And in fact, I, I wouldn't want anyone else involved. I, I do have my younger sister who was there for a decade before in operations who had really great foundational knowledge uh, involved as a minority partner. So this, this story is interesting because it's got family involved in it too, like buying from first generation and then also uh, negotiating like equity split and role with uh, a sibling. Yeah. And I tried to do it as much arm's length like love you all but this is a business transaction and that's the most fair way to do it and we don't have to do this deal um and you know no harm no foul we all want to still be family so yeah. that was really hard and that seems that will sound like the imperative that you not gonna underpay for it but you need to overpay to keep those family bonds together yeah, and it's a feel good for me. Uh, I didn't know what I didn't know, John, and I've yeah. and I'm fine. I, I paid three x too much of what I would buy now. Yeah. So well, I think yeah, there's a lesson family. there. Like it's difficult. Yeah. Just probably. Did they think it was worth more, or were they happy and settled? Or yeah, it's they they were ecstatic about it, and um, oh wow, yeah. so it it was way more than. I think they would have put on it even. Um, yeah. and so that's, I think, terrible negotiation on my part, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I learned my lessons and it got me in the game. And so if you're a good operator, I, I don't encourage people to overpay or overbuy, like you make money when you buy, um, or you at least hedge your bets. Um, but I knew I could grow the thing, and I knew because of all the hair on it that I could improve uh, the cash flow and be able to buy the thing. So uh, I guess part of it was ignorance and, and family loyalty, but also part of it was like, I do know what I'm doing here. There's some ways that I'm covering my butt. Yeah. Um, we doubled business organically overnight just by looking for lookalikes, meaning who's our best clients? And how do we get out and get more of them? And uh, so we were able to double, but this is a service business and they're hard to grow and hard to scale. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's not like a game. software. It's like software can scale like that. I mean, a service business like this, you just got to add more translators, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Well, let me, yeah, let yeah. me ask you about the okay. capital stack. Did you go to the traditional route of like SBA, put some money down, or did you seller finance with the family or? Yeah, I, so I didn't even look at traditional financing. It's just, this is a non-asset heavy, it's asset light service company. So it's perfect for the SBA, but at that time I didn't know about it. So yeah. what we did was equity and seller note. And I think it's great, I, not only for, for getting underwritten and creating whatever terms you want, but also it gave me assurances too, if something was like terribly wrong, I could offset against that seller note. And also I got to pay them more interest and they get more money for the deal. So this was a, a, a equity plus um, seller note deal. Yeah. And you jumped in, you got this, congratulations. You jumped in and how fast were you able to double it? What, the first year or six Within months? Year. Or? Within, Within the year. Within a year. Yeah. And that's and easy that's to do for a small business. That's business development, knocking on doors and increasing sales. Yes. Yeah. I bought a small business, John. And when you buy a small business, you got to be willing to do every role from ops to HR to sales. Like it's all hands on deck. Um, and ignorantly, you know, I didn't know that, but I was all in. You know, I think the, the family component propels you too. There's a lot of people downstream relying on my success. Um, and so, yeah, we doubled. And I, I think out of necessity, you just go, who are we servicing well today? that we can you know, find a look like across town and, and contact them and have a good story to tell them. And it's a service business, so it's all about trust. So if we're already having success with uh, you know, somebody they know as their competitor or in the same space, it's really it lowers the hurdle to work with us. Yeah. So you did a lot of, I mean, you kind of look like the same path I took. I was in VP of marketing, VP of sales, business development, all the way through my startup career and, and, and bigger companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's easy for us to see that's where it can help. How, how were you on fin the financials, reading the profit loss and the accounting of it? All, that all, all in. Uh, you got the, got the uh, chart of accounts organized in a way that is going to work for me. You know, show us what our margins are. Uh, yeah. And I, I didn't. I studied economics, so. Oh, so sure. you, yeah, you've gone through a number of accounting uh, classes and yeah. Yeah, I did all of that. But honestly, the theory doesn't help. So it's it's really getting in, understanding cash flow, uh, a simple P&L and balance sheet, like understand them, know them. How does uh, you know money flow through the company from start to finish and how quick does it turn from an order to cash in the bank? Like those are so yeah. important. Um, some, some shout outs to um, Simple Numbers. There's two fantastic books that were my Bible. Um, I think it's called Simple Numbers, A Straight Talk and Big Profits by Greg Crabtree. And then he came out with a second book, which is about scaling a business. So using those foundations, but then like growing a business, you can waste a lot of time and money. So how do we like keep track as we're growing uh, that we're not losing sight of cash flow and all those things. So highly recommend those books. And uh, I Definitely. think that's an underrated skill too, is just in time learning as an entrepreneur. Like, you know, these business books, I hate reading them cover to cover. Like why bother unless it's like got some fiction in there, like use it as a reference book. You know, this is a bad example. This is a cocktail book, but like today. It's sitting on the coffee table. Makes it, yeah. makes the library look good. It does. Yeah. It's like today I'm dealing with this issue and somebody solved it in this book. I've got, this as my reference it's going to help me figure out like, what do I do with the issue right now? So yeah, uh, I, I know that your audience is like consuming this podcast and consuming you know books or audio books. I just want to double tap on that like life hack that don't feel bad if you can't read a book cover to cover, like even better, just read the relevant part and implement the hell out of it. Yeah. I, I had always had a trouble. Uh, I learned this, like I was consuming a lot of books written by professors and I go, well, they have no practical now knowledge if they've never been in the mm -hmm. industry, like to mm -hmm. show me some specific example where this theory worked out or didn't work mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I stopped buying books from professors that didn't have mm -hmm. any real world expense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's listen to John's podcast and glean <laughs> lessons. And uh, I, I think that's, that's the way to do it as uh, you get real world experience and 
yeah. betting on yourself, getting into the game. And I guess if I could like direct the conversation even more forward is now we're doing a roll up in this industry, which that was not the original guy. I'm an accidental roll up entrepreneur. Um, didn't know to buy a business to start. You figured that out, grew it to, you know, doubled in size and realized this is hard. I, I will still keep growing, but like buying a business was pretty great. Let's do this again. And uh, let's, let's buy a similar business. So use the same lookalike strategy. Like I, I've come up with a decent playbook in the last 12 months of how to make this thing sing. Um, and can we expand a new geography, but it's like the same business and I just implement the same playbook. And that's what we did. Uh, I think it was like a year and a half later we closed, but I started looking, I think six months after I bought Language Network because I, I knew it was going to take time. And I looked at a lot of different companies and just started getting familiar with the whole traditional search model of like talking to brokers, talking to building your own direct outreach pipeline yeah. and uh, kind of seeing what's out there. And uh, until I finally found one, it was like, let's make an offer on this bad boy. And so we bought our where, second Where was company, it located? Washington State, uh, yeah. just north of Seattle. And you're uh, in Santa Barbara, California, right? And I'm in or California. Yeah. yeah, Santa Barbara. And was this, uh, was this an on-market deal or an off-market deal? This one was like on biz by sell. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and it was uh, through a, a non-industry, you know, just general salt-of-the-earth business broker. Uh, Fred the broker, um, fantastic guy. Been doing it for many, many years. And... Uh, we, he was fantastic. He helped guide, and there's not a lot of good brokers out there, so I got lucky. He helped set the expectations with the seller. Uh, the seller wanted to retire and exit, and those are the only deals that I do is you know replacing ownership. I think they they go off. That's that's our roll up. That's we it. That's in the playbook. That's rule like a hard fast commandment. Yep, we're okay. we're not mixing chefs in the kitchen. We're uh, actually integrating and we're one company and uh, we standardize and, and bring the people into the fold and build one, one common team. It like takes time. Like scale driven synergies. That's what you're doing this roll up. Like, so what was the size of this business? It's, it was another small deal. Uh, it was uh, 1.5 million gross revenue, uh, but that allowed us to double. So remember, I bought Language Network at seven hundred. Yeah, we you're, you're at three point nine. Or yeah, you're yeah. At threes. Um, so we doubled again. And it was like a magic trick overnight. Like boom, and you've got boom. new new customers, new team, new uh, service capabilities. Like you got the customers and the fulfillment. Like this is amazing. Uh, and so we we cut our teeth on that, and then we went into COVID. And I was like going, holy shit, what did we sign up for here? Uh, <laughs> and I used SBA on this one. Yeah, um, yeah. So by this time, I wisened up that there's other uh, ways to do these deals. I, I did SBA try and SBA at that time was uh, 6% right around, right? Yeah, I, I think it was six and a quarter or something. Yeah, um, that's not now. The good old days, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a great vehicle. Uh, great lender. They loved it. We bought the deal. Yeah, I think we paid four hundred something thousand, um, and uh, and the multiple again, definitely lower two, than the one two. It, it was like two and a quarter, two, two and a quarter, two five on wow. on uh, a mixture of EBITDA and the owner's salary that, that they were taking out a little too much. Um, it was a good deal. This is the best deal I've done. The second anything one. throwing off four hundred thousand and two point five is something to look at. Yeah. 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 You make your own luck. I, I'm not going to be on this podcast and say, I got all my shit figured out. I, it's just continuing to look and you kiss a lot of frogs and then you find one that's great. And uh, the reason I think they sold and at that price was they were truly motivated to exit and they were truly motivated to see the company go to the right person. Yeah. And How for old them, was the that, company? 35 years. Oh, uh, another duplicate of your dad's and your mom's. Yeah. Yeah. 
that it was tailor made for us to buy the business and and we stuck with our criteria it looked exactly like our our business the type of services the type of customers just new geo and uh, i flew up there uh i this was like the first talk to the broker and the first thing i did sure i got some financials i signed an nda but i flew up there and i spent the whole day with the seller how, and, how did that uh kind of uh make them feel how serious you were that you actually went and visit them. You think that helped the sale? Were there multiple offers John, on this? Nobody else or... did it. Yeah. Nobody else there... did it. So I was oh, late to the party. Yeah. They had already gotten a few offers from other people. They had you know, talked to other people. Um, and so the, nobody else had done this. And it seems like an obvious thing. You spend a couple hundred dollars on airfare, or at least back then it was. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, treat them to a meal, and then uh, you make so much more ground and rapport by by breaking bread and being face to face. Yeah. And uh, the broker too did not block this. Like that's also uh, a sign of a good broker is it encourages that buyer seller potential get together. So, yeah, yeah. I, I I encourage that. I uh, mm -hmm. I have a student right now. She I said go visit them. I mean, and take your mm -hmm. baby. Because the, the peers are selling the peers, and they want to make sure that whoever they turn mm -hmm. it over to is kind of a you know mirror of themselves, which mm -hmm. it was. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It, the current, the only currency. It's a mistake. Yeah, everyone wants to maximize the price of their exit. The seller does, but there's other current forms of currency of value in a deal, uh, and it's important to find that out. What what is it? What and and for this one, it was legacy and feeling like you said that they're signed to appear somebody who is a mini them many years ago and are going to treat their business right. Yeah. Were there? Do you recall any red flag sticking points that just took longer to navigate and negotiate? So this this deal took about a year, even doing a that. year, even yeah. doing that. The deal fell apart twice, and. Oh, shit. Uh, so they say, you know, you don't have a deal until it's died two deaths. Your money's uh, in the account for the seller. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so it, it took a year, even a small deal like this. But I was convicted that this was the right deal for us and the right next deal to do, a look-alike deal. And, uh, you know, it was had paper. It was the same playbook that we did with Language Network. Um, so I stuck around. I think a lot of people would have said, you know, whatever, the seller's bipolar, they're paying in my, you know what, I'm going to go on to the next one. But I was very patient and I, uh, sure I have an ego, but that's the biggest blocker. I, I didn't have an ego in this deal. I just, I, I was convicted and I was willing to let the seller go through their emotions of up and down and leverage the broker to kind of get them to that place a year later where we're bottle of champagne. You know, congratulations. I'm getting the keys and we're buying this thing. Yeah. And the broker was some kind of like uh intermediary that was helping like the guy wants more money or is there some yeah, kind of sticking cop, point? Bad cop. And, yeah. 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 All of the terms. Right. And then, <laughs> and he's telling the seller like, Hey, he's a good buyer. He's got a business that's going to take yeah. care of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I built a good relationship with that broker, um, and he he did a good job of actually like helping set expectations with the seller of like knowing that this is the deal you need to take. I think a lot of brokers are too short sighted, and they they, they don't they let the market well, it's, yeah know, it's ten percent the seller you know yeah so they could just turn over uh, you know a couple million dollar deal and make ten percent. I'm I'm off to the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we built enough of a good relationship, the broker and I, that he brought me another deal, and that was the next one. And so here now we're actually a roll up. We're we're working. We might be small deals, but we're we're rolling things up and we're moving. We're improving the cash flow. Um, well, let me let me uh, let me okay. ask you about your dad and your sure. telling your dad at whatever event you're at, like, hey, we just bought another business, we double revenue, double profits, and like, what's he saying? He's just, you know, he's proud as hell as you and what? Yeah, you know, the business is so different than 
what they knew, um, but they're proud as hell. Um, and I just took them. We did a company all hands in Mexico, and it's like 43 of us now instead of just four when they I bought it from them. And we're like 15x the size and revenue. Uh, and so they could only comprehend so much, John. That like when I brought them to Mexico for the sales, or it was it an was entire company kickoff, but we did a sales kickoff too, where they just saw all the people and like their legacy, how it's just been amplified. Like they got teary eyed. It was really special. Oh, that's special fantastic. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice to hear. Yeah. It, 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 it's a feel good opportunity and it's changed my life trajectory economically. Plus, I, I, feel great because i've benefited people i know and love uh, namely my family and and now i've got a bunch of team members my employees in tow and the uh, this roll-up strategy um uh, that i tripped and fell into but seized the moment on uh is a fantastic way to go uh, yeah i you know i have to make a point here this this sometimes these the wealth created in families is generational rome wasn't built in a day and it takes mm -hmm. a while mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. A hundred percent. And yeah. I'm grateful for them to have had this industry already picked out and curated for me. Not everyone has that. Um, so I didn't have to search forever uh, to try and find like an industry or a like, niche. what do I do? What do I buy? What am I doing? You know? Yeah. And I know that's a struggle. And, and not only that, but it's like hyper fragmented. It's like the ideal, uh, you know, industry to do a roll up in. Um, so that that was wham bam curated for me and i'm just seizing the opportunity yeah so this broker you you got a great relationship now you're a serious buyer and does he specifically look out for other businesses that are doing this and say you know hey do you want to sell do you want to sell because i got a great buyer right i, I got a real exactly buyer. yeah yeah exactly uh so he said i i will um start doing a search for you doing mailers and so uh he introduced me to two deals. I ended up buying one of them, uh, but that's the power of uh, being a known buyer and a, a good person, easy person to work with. Is, yeah. Uh, you just start Reputation, deal credibility. Yeah. Yeah. What you talked about earlier is the currency right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so he got paid uh, you know, twice working with me. Um, hopefully he's still out there. I, I think we've slowed on on the deals or he's exhausted that geography for us. But, um, so we did this, this, you know, I bought my third company and we doubled again. So, it, so it was it's another 1.5 or, or what was that? 3 million, it was like 3 million. So 3 it was million, just, it was nice. Like, you know, leveling up. Uh, so now we've you know doubled again. Um, and we're growing double digits, like 15 to 20% organically too, with sales and marketing yeah. and uh, talking to our customers proactively, raising the rates. Like, oh my gosh, I love raising the rates, especially it's like, <laughs> it's straight like, to the bottom line, guys. That's the first uh, thing you do. I'll tell you, yes. you come in and just raise the rates. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it doesn't have to be a huge jump or maybe it should be, but um you don't want to damage the goodwill and, and the clients. So know a little bit of what you're doing, but definitely raise the rates. And it's probably more than what you like are having anxiety on. Just raise the rates. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you about the calf stack on this one. How did you buy this uh, SBA this traditional round? Yeah. yeah. So now, now we're branching out, getting a little more creative. This uh, third deal had some large customer concentration, in fact, 50%. And, but it's, it's a key vertical that we want to be in. And so at first you go, hell no, that's risk I don't need to take. But when right. you start getting to know the story, how long the customer's been there, let me see the contract, talking about the workflow. Um, and then putting a structure in place that you know, your, the seller has to put their money where their mouth is, we'll give you 50% consideration for the company. Uh, at close. So that's our own equity. Um, and then we're going to split the other remaining 50% in two buckets. One's going to be a seller note and you'll get some interest on it. It's five years. And then the other is a royalty agreement. And so you're going to get mailbox money on that key customer, you know, X percent for X five years, I think. 
And, you know, just that's going to you- mitigate your risk that this 50% customer concentration, the single customer sticks around. How long were they with the company when you started this transaction? Do you recall? How long was the client with the company? Yeah. Uh, at least a, at least a decade. Uh, oh, okay. So that's, that's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, belief that they're going to stick around for another five years. Yeah. And yes, exactly. But also not, um, I, when I bought language network, I failed to share like, uh, the largest customer made up 25% of the business in the first year churned out and they had been a customer for 10 plus years. So I bought a $700,000 business and then what is that? Uh, almost 200,000 is walking out the door and I'm going, holy shit, I got to replace this. Uh, yeah. so I forgot to mention that happened in the first 12 months. So I had some scar oh, tissue. That's with your, your, your mom and dad's business, right? The yeah. first round. Yeah. And, yeah. And that was like, uh, I mean, that, that was stressful time, really stressful, but that, that nothing a tissue, sales guy can't handle though. <laughs> right? That's right. Just one more deal. I'll solve everything. <laughs> Um, the phone going. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's if you're a business owner or you're buying a business, you got to be willing to get out there and sell and represent. Um, and that's why I'm still here. Um, it's not having an aversion to that. Uh, but with this deal that informed this deal, it's like, there's no need to take that risk. Let's structure this. So we win together. I think we capped that royalty agreement. So we don't pay an egregious amount. What we've done in that deal is we've grown that account. So if anything, we've accelerated their payback on that, that big concentrated customer. Yeah, there you go. And they're happy with that. There are no complaints. Yeah, that's right. They, they're a great reference for us. Uh, and cause there's a lot of deals now for bolt on that are not bankable. Like if you go to the SBA, how much customer concentration does this, uh, target have? I think some banks that are good will say, Oh, how does it fit into your entire org? Like, it's not just 50% of the target company. Now it's 5% of your entire org. If they're yeah. underwriting the deal and you're doing a roll up. Uh, but on its own, this wouldn't have been an SBA bankable deal because of that risk. So yeah, that's a, a that's an interesting, you got to shop that around. I mean, if you were a subcontractor or a supporter of the oil and G industry, where mm-hmm. 90% of your customers come from, you know, revenue comes from one customer. Mm-hmm. You have to shop that around because there's like Live Oak Bank will do that or mm-hmm. Byline mm-hmm. Bank will do that. But there's an SBA mm-hmm. lender in, you know, uh, Texas that'll do it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. It, it's not every SBA lender is created equally, as you pointed out. Everyone's got a different credit appetite or, or underwriting approach. Yeah. Do, so, Ray, let me ask you about these this integration and this uh, uh, platform that you got. Did did you have any difficulty in, you know, you bring these people on and there's now duplication. You have to let people go. That's never this been our... part of this business. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, if you're signing up, especially for a personal guarantee, you know, you owe it to yourself and the company and the customers to make fiscally responsible decisions, which does involve letting people go at times. Um, but the truth of it is I'm in a service business and we're only as good as the people doing the service. And not only that, I, I've bought businesses that are kind of lifestyle or not very standardized. And so you don't want to come in with a hatchet and start losing goodwill with the customers or tribal knowledge on how we deliver the service. So um, our model is not to underwrite like cutting a bunch of people. Um, in fact, it's to try and keep as many people as possible and repurpose them first uh, into more dollar productive roles or, or tasks. And my experience so far is we've been able to retain the people that are excited and then naturally churn out people that just, they can't get over that we're just a different entity now or you know, their life is calling them elsewhere. And so this is an interesting point because success is through the people. And I, I need to get buy-in. And I, if I cut heads, like I'm going to cut all my goodwill as the new owner. Uh, and it's going to be hard to redo that first impression. So you're not touching any of the, the people. In fact, you, you're not pulling any of the benefits back. You're looking for quick wins to build trust with the team. 
Uh, in one instance, there were like three people in a company we bought and I raised their salaries by 20% overnight. That hurts. Uh, but it was an equitability thing. Uh, when I looked at similar people doing their job at the other companies, I, I just assumed they're going to talk. Oh, that's and great. Goodwill. It'd be, yeah. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be right if I'm doing the same job, I'm getting X percent less. Uh, in fact, they had more experience. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I did. Um, but John, here's what I, what we do. This is a critical part of the playbook. And I encourage everyone to do that is we hire overseas, uh, for every role possible, unless you actually physically need somebody on site, specifically Latin America for time zone, for cultural alignment, for it's a great knowledge base. Like they speak perfect English. Uh, and we work remote, so it's just ideal. We're able to place somebody that's maybe a third of the cost of a U.S. equivalent. Yeah, and so yeah. as we've grown and we open up new roles, it's always higher in Latin America. Um, and we have the best team. And it, it makes cash flow sing. Like truly, if you can take your labor expense and make it a third, if, if not a half, uh, you have to so, keep outsourcing to finding new locations. Yeah. 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 So and where the, are we talking people, about? Are we talking about the Philippines or? Specifically Latin America. Latin America. And, and so we've done four acquisitions now total, and we're trying to do one to two per year. Uh, but I spun off um, our internal recruiting team, a uh, sister company called Hire Globo. And they are our dedicated recruiting, hiring, staffing, all the things like build our team in Latin America. Um, and we spun it off because friends and other entrepreneurs were asking, like, how do we do what you do uh, and place amazing this is talent? like This was operating expense that you turned into a profit center. Yeah, we created a business around it. And I'm so bullish on it because it... It transforms cash flow. It transforms like operations. You're going to find people that are nothing, no offense to any of my U.S. team members. Like they're amazing people and nothing wrong with hiring the U.S. But I've just found like the the retention uh, to detail, the buy-in, the commitment that you're paying them in U.S. dollars. So it gives a lot of stability in that region of the world. Um, and if you can work remote, like what does it matter? Like with COVID. I think it proved even to small, medium-sized business that we can operate in a non-physical location. So why not another country? Uh, tech with the technology is there, and uh, the resources are there to hire those folks. Yeah, this is like a. I mean, if you ever read uh, uh, books on uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Mm -hmm. His first acquisition was a textile company. And he goes, oh, yeah, this is a horrible thing because they started outsourcing other than the United States. So, Yeah. 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 It's it, the big guys have been doing it a long time. I think what's interesting now for like entrepreneurs, especially the acquisition entrepreneurs is like, we can do it too. It's, it's just as effective, if not more for small, medium sized businesses. So, what was this last one? You mentioned into the, the third one you're working on that you, you completed. Where, where was that from? So, so, um, or was it the fourth we, one? Yeah. What's well, the fourth acquisition total? Uh, and that was in the Bay area in California. So kind of still supplementing our geographies, but this one was a little bit different. It pushed us into some different service lines. Uh, and what's interesting now at our size and stage is, uh, we can start selling these other services to the rest of our customer base that we have with the other three companies. Uh, and so now the playbook has evolved and the scope has expanded a little bit to, we don't just have to do a lookalike acquisition. Uh, we could kind of buy in a different service um, or pick up a different vertical or industry. Um, and so that's what this one really allowed. It allowed us to diversify our services, do more translation, localization, your technical websites, uh, things of that nature. Yeah. And broker on market deal through a broker or off market? Okay. Good question. This one is actually uh, self sourced. And I've gone deep in this industry. It's a, it's a fantastic one. 
the takeaway for people that listen to this podcast is pick an industry and go to all the conferences and attend the webinars and find the gray hairs and go make friends with them um, and, and be a known entity. And so I would give talks at all of these conferences and uh, talk about what we're doing in sales or operations or talk about buying a business. And, and so that's where this one came from was uh, just being a known entity. We're a part of the same association. Yeah. How big was it? Um, it was around 2.5 million. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're doubling, um, every couple of years here. Yeah. Every year oh, yeah. so far. Yeah. Oh, it's incredible. And, uh, the, we've made the Inc 5,000, which is a vanity metric, you know, what do you do? Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but that's the, the power of acquisition in this business model is hyper fragmented industry. Uh, get in, come up with your operational playbook, uh, be able to scale your people and reduce the costs and improve the cash flow and, and get good at, at buying and integrating them. But there's a lot of other industries like mine that people can Did do. Did the, the reason to sell meet your past requirements or the playbook, which was retiring? Yeah. It did. Um, but this one, uh, this one hurt out of all of them. You know, they were all smooth. What hurt is I just had the seller who I thought we had good will in, um, the working capital. It's, it's always, a we always include working capital in the price. And I don't know if we'll continue to do that. If we'll just say the traditional lower, sense of working capital, right? What the net normal like total cash current position, assets minus total current liabilities. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. In order to keep the lights on, I'm buying a car. I need gas and oil in it, and air in the tires, so we can keep driving it. Like that's the blood in your body. Like if you took yes. out eight pints, you're dead. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not. I'm not buying a car, and then we're gonna pull it over the side of the road. You take all the tires, and I'm just gonna be stuck there. So uh, it it always adds time to getting these deals done because they just don't get it. like that's my money. That's that's all mine. Yeah. Like, it's, it's this S SMBs are. It's just traditionally like they they think that's their business and they take it out of the business. A lot mm -hmm. of SBA lenders like, well, you know what, you know, you're gonna borrow a little bit more mm -hmm. to put it back in. Yeah, yeah. I, but I I think the fallacy is to value put a multiple on the cash flow and not include the working capital in that total price. Like when you buy stock in a company, it includes its balance sheet. Like the value of that company includes what what's in it and. um so that's, I guess, what was frustrating is their understanding of how we settle working capital. And they had, they had like a, a family consigliere attorney and some other friend of a friend who was giving them bad advice on what working capital is. And uh, so that one, we were for nine months trying to avoid this escalating to the next level. Um, and trying to explain like general gap accounting principles of working capital and the purchase agreement. We thought it spelled it out pretty clear of what it is. Um, and so they're just a pain in my ass. Um, it would be one thing if they're ignorant, but they just, um, they didn't want to hand over the keys. I'd ask them to consult with us for a period of time. I always do a transition. I don't know. I'd stop me if this isn't valuable, but it just, it's not rainbows and butterflies, I guess, is the takeaway from this story here when you're buying businesses. I don't uh, think there ever is. I mean, yeah, yeah, but it's easy. Anybody could say, let's go buy a business. But like once you operate it, you know what you bought. And I got something that was so owner dependent, I didn't realize. And so you rip them out. Like there's a lot of things that the you know, balls are going to get dropped and like make sure it's not a crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, so that's what was messy about this one. In fact, like their ego um, was like so big, like they didn't care about the success of the company. They cared about their what they got from it, their pound of flesh. And so it, it was a, like a Dr. and Jackal, Dr. Hyde thing. Like we were, you know, knew each other from the association, negotiated this deal. And then when it actually comes time to pay them and hand over the keys, it, it's like a struggle. Started walking, acting weird. Ego stuff. Yeah. It's worth more. 
I don't want to yeah. get rid of it. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, I'm not introducing you to those clients. Like I'm still involved in the email. And so it got to a place where it's like, I smiled and pushed her out the door and, uh, you know, shut off email, shut off everything. Like didn't give any notice. And, uh, just cause I didn't trust them. They were playing yeah. games with the team, like back channeling, like, Hey, get this paid in, get that paid in the night before we're closing. They're still, um, like making donations and prepayments and doing all this wonky stuff to try and lower their tax basis. Um, cause we're doing an entity purchase. We're doing a stock purchase. We're buying yeah, a corporation. Yeah, that, well, that, that should come with working capital. Clearly. Yeah. yeah. Without yeah. question. Yeah. So there was a lot of games and trust was broken. Uh, and yeah, I'm playing a long game. I don't, it, it sucks. I can't give a, a great experience to everyone. They got to own that too. Uh, but that one was just unnecessarily hard. She was getting yeah. bad advice from her advisors, the ignorance, the ego, all of those things. Uh, made it a tough. Was there time. any tit for tat retaliation on her part? I mean, somebody that's done doing that, you would kind of imagine it's not out of the realm of her starting up another, another operation right in her hometown. You know, violating the non compete. Yeah, but again, we have a seller note involved, and there's offsets, so I do have uh, a means. Uh, that is, you know, financially significant to yeah. uh, accommodate that. No, any, but they were any done. lawsuits they, going on? It's no, just no, no. thank God. Okay. Uh, I've I've been a part of mediation, not because of buying uh, these businesses, but you want to avoid that at all costs. Um, and it's like, a drain. I, yeah, yeah. Don't don't do that. Like the, I've got a business to run here. I've got customer support and. Uh, even if I have to put my ego aside to avoid a lawsuit, uh, I'll do it. I'll, it just nobody wins. And then uh, you spend a, ton, a lot of time and money. The attorneys win. And then you don't even feel vindicated. Like you just feel exhausted. So my best advice there is set up your contract. So there's, you know, automatic provisions of how issues will be solved. I mean, there's good attorneys that will advise you. I think there's a few online that, um, and uh, yeah, do your best to just keep your eyes on the most important Let me ask thing. you about that because you were in the software industry. I was in the software industry. And what happens is you buy these different mom and pops. They're all using different software to manage yeah. language services. Was that the case in this? or And, and yeah. did you have a big enterprise solution? or? Oh, this is a great topic, John, uh, because I came from the startup world and thought software is innovative, you know, custom CRM, all of these things. I've come full cycle on that, you know, off the shelf, off the shelf, off the shelf. We're in this new world. There's no code solutions. Like don't waste your time and dollars building something custom unless it truly is IP and unique. But yeah. I'd say at this point in 2024, 90% of the stuff that used to be unique five years ago, like you can get off the shelf solution that's better supported. Especially uh, if you're buying a 30 year old business, like and it, the industry's been around for yes. a long time. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and I'm, I want to drop this nugget for everyone because um, each of the businesses did have custom software in it and we replaced it. We replaced it off the shelf. We standardize. Yeah. So when you do a purchase, you get to allocate the purchase price towards different asset buckets. And custom software is the best. Uh, Oh, almost one of the best buckets to allocate as much purchase price to. I believe it's like a three year. Uh, there's a huge R and D tax credits for this. For like, yeah, yeah, it's it's you can accelerate your depreciation uh, massively if if not use bonus depreciation on that bucket. I think it's sixty percent this year, and it's going down like twenty percent each year. But it's a huge advantage to the buyer to put purchase price in custom software like the irs doesn't know how to value custom software it's it's what you tell them it is and so <laughs> so yeah you take you take a purchase price and you can only put some of it towards ar and then usually a lot of it goes to goodwill which you know goodwill is 15 year uh depreciation schedule like that's nothing to get excited about but this custom software bucket like Hallelujah. I can get this in three years. And uh, so 
I just wanted to double tap on that for anyone. If there's any way you can justify it or stretch and get there, uh, allocate your purchase price in that custom software bucket. Yeah. So off the shelf software, every, all your organizations are, are using this enterprise solution now. One single. Yeah. Yeah, I think every industry now has some sort of niche SaaS solution. So find yeah. find what that is. You know, buy the monthly subscription if you're so inclined. Pay for it in a year and save twenty percent. But um, focus on customers. Like that's in a service business. That's where your success is. Is yeah, and you can find that going, to, and going to the trade shows. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. How has your role changed? I mean, you're doubling almost every year uh, and tripling now year four. Uh, how, how has your role changed from just wearing a lot of hats to running a CEO, you know, 43 people plus? Mm -hmm. well, it's an evolution and yeah. uh, I don't want to ever be the bottleneck. And uh, some how, how, good do you know that? how do you <laughs> so, know that? We all have blind spots, so a good therapist. Uh, <laughs> Did you? I, think, I, gotta, I have to point this out because I've told this a couple of times. Did you ever read Michael Dell's book? No. His I first didn't. book? Yeah. No. So his first book was, you know, Dell was at $50 million. And the guy walked into my office and goes, hey, I need the uh, keys to the Coke machine. And he goes, why? It's like, hmm. you know, I lost uh, some quarters in it. And he goes like, well, I've been told you're the only one with the keys. I was. That was my big blind spot. Like, hmm. what am I doing? The only person with the keys to the Coke machine. Yep. 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 <clears throat> That's a great, great anecdote. It's there's still stuff like that. That there's a there's a shedding of responsibilities to people um, that um, I probably overlooked as an important skill uh, to be able to bring people in and trust that they're going to do it and. And uh, you give them the space to do it and then start focusing on other more productive tasks and you got to move up that stack. Yeah. So you, what, what's the test? Like, do you say this is a $5 an hour task or this is a $1,000 an hour task and you put some kind of test to it? That's, this that's is the challenge. Really... Like, I'm going to like 93% of businesses never get over a million dollars because it's the owner. They don't want to, or they don't have the will to, right. Or they don't know how to. Yeah. 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 It's the bottleneck for all of these small businesses is the owner a hundred percent. And it just, it's the owner. Um, small businesses stay small for a reason. And, uh, it's hard to scale. It's hard to grow because the 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 leader uh, needs to grow too and change their perspective. So um, we've been growing super fast. Fortunately for me, I felt like I got executive level experience before I started this acquisition journey. Um, I've seen what's possible at a hyper growth organization. Uh, but gosh, John, I'm not perfect. There's still stuff my team pings me for, and I go. Holy shit, I'm the one that has the keys of the Coke machine. <laughs> and uh, I have an executive assistant now, so I think that's a high Erica. leverage point. Yes. yes. She's amazing. Uh, she's my right-hand woman. And uh, like we're a work pair, she's in my email. Uh, she, she works on my behalf. The team knows they can go to her, and they're going to get an answer faster if they go to me. Um, so that's a high leverage point too, for an owner or operator is, uh, to take a lot of admin off is to hire an executive assistant. She's in Mexico yeah. city, my company hired Globo, like we we found her and, and put her in place and it's been amazing. Truly. Yeah, like fantastic. Like, I, I think I get to quantify this. I got, I think at least a full day back in my work week by hiring an executive assistant. Wow. Okay. Do you speak other languages? I probably should have asked this earlier. Like, do you speak any other languages? Claro que sí. I speak right. Spanish and English, and uh, I wish I spoke Spanish a little bit better. Uh, the team will say I'm, I'm very rusty. Yeah. I have to ask you about what else has changed. Like, there's always the management, and then there's the systems. Like, what about capital it's like that? Are, are different... So because it sounds like the acquisitions you made, you're kind of tapped out on SBA. They have like a five-year minimum on a 10-year rule. So uh, 
How's capital allocation? You find new sources. Are they coming to you? Good question. We've retired all of our, our 7A debt. So we are oh, really locked okay. and loaded, ready to, to take on more. We just got to find the right deals to go somewhere to else. Because that 12%, I mean, you can find, you should be able to get it at 7 to 8%. I, I agree with you. Uh, but also, there's no loan covenants, and a 10 year amortization is amazing. It means you can make a lot of mistakes and recover. So I, I, I it's expensive, yes. Uh, but I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, thumb at it. And we are at the size and stage where we probably uh, could leverage alternative folks, like a true cash flow loan, um, yeah. uh, or debt. You know, making sure the the coverage ratio can handle it. Um, but I'm still a fan of SBA seven A at our size and stage, especially for the leverage. If you're doing a roll up, uh, maybe this is common knowledge or not, but. Uh, you can do as low as zero percent down. Oh, that's right. At, if it's in a if it's an acquisition in the same exact industry, yes, that's right. Same yeah. same NAIC code is the the speci- is is how they look at it. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing. Um, there's no reason to do a dumb deal and leverage up, but it's there for you if you know how to use it. Yeah. So, so right w- now we're we're reloaded. We're retiring some some seller notes to answer your question. Um, you know, the, we're on the, like the last years of that and, uh, it, it's time to, uh, use the equity we're, we've got, it's like, a a flywheel, like you grow it to a certain size, you get enough cash flow from it, put it to work, put it to work into the next deal. It's uh, a gravity and mass. It's like physics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's magic. Yeah. Yeah. So did you have any deals that, you know, you, you called off, died? Anything like that? I mean, I can't believe you went three for three. And <laughs> yeah, the, you kiss a lot happen. of frogs. You kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince charming. Uh, I want to say we've looked at fifty seriously. We've probably, if I could just quantify the pipeline, uh, fifty serious um, like packets or financials. And I put, I've put together like the list of things that I want to see in addition to whatever brokers put out there. And I also use it for self-sourced. Um, I think nice marketing out, documents from the Sims, yes. Yeah, yeah whatever. Give me the, the source financials and I'll spice and dice the way I like to. Um, and then we probably put out eight offers, maybe I'm missing one, nine offers to get to where we are. Uh, I've done four deals. Uh, so a couple of deals that fell apart, I think two come to mind that we got under contract. And I like to say to the seller, like, we're going to go slow and get you an LOI that we can consummate that I feel really good about. I don't like retrading. I don't want to have that reputation. You know, they're playing a long game here. Yeah, uh, changing the price, changing things like this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to promise you the moon and then later, you know, find reasons to just nickel and dime you down to where the price should have been. So I'll go slow and 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 try and explain our, our thought process while keeping enthusiasm for the deal up um, to let them know I'm not just trying to beat them down on price. I'm still really excited about it, but we've got to be in this range. Um, so I worked on a deal I, I think that hurts and I'm still recovering from for the last year and literally a year. And this one I flew out uh, to Dubai for. So still the same playbook. Uh, we're at the size and stage where we can go international. They had a footprint out there and the seller said, Hey, we're over here for a month. Um, and I said, well, great. Why don't I come out there and we'll spend a couple of days and I'll learn about your business and see if we can do something. Their customer base was also domestic in the U S so it wasn't a full, you know, left turn. Let's go crazy and buy something halfway across the world. Right. Um, right. Where your ego is kind of overstepping yeah. its bounds. Yeah. Yeah, and and maybe looking back on it, there was some ego driving it for sure. It sounds sexy and exciting. Yeah, we're ready for this. We've done these deals that are like lookalikes and in the U.S. Um, but this one would have pushed us into a different category. And um, I had to walk from this one two weeks before closing, and that was one of the hardest decisions: is to be so committed but so bipolar about the deal that at any moment you need to be able to walk and that ego you just mentioned, like keep it in check. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, the wisdom of my wife, my CFO, um, you know, trusted friends that know what we're doing, you help keep you in check. And I guess there were some red flags and diligence, John. Um, that your slow. wife and everybody else saw very early on, probably. Yeah, of course. That's what we were talking about earlier, blind spots that you don't yeah. see. And uh, they hear you complain about it or talk about it, and they can see it. So it's good to have a, a soundboard when you're playing this game. It's easy to get lost in the details of buying a company and have rose-colored lenses of what it's going to look like after you buy it. Um, so the story here is uh, there was some tech involved, and we were paying a premium multiple. And uh, we got new news that their top salesperson uh, was probably going to churn out for health reasons. Um, we, I was reading between the lines. They were saying, we need sales, we need sales, we need sales. And I realized they didn't have any pipeline once I got an updated sales pipeline. Uh, and then once I got a technical diligence back like on how they're operating, they did have some custom software which again, 10 years ago would have been innovative and exciting, uh, was not up to snuff. And the forecast went from, you know, our base case to worse than our worst case yeah. of cash flow. And we would have lost money for the, the first two years with this, you know, reforecast now knowing the new sales forecast and the cost to reinvest in the, the systems. And so, uh, you know, I, I sure I have an ego, but I, I like the uh, cash flow and the compound to, to be able to pay for the debt that I'm going to incur on exactly. this acquisition. It, yeah, it's it's just the cost and the upside were out of whack, and the the ego for the seller was so high that there was no way in hell that they would accept a retrade, and I think we would have had to be around fifty percent of what we originally yeah. offered to make it work, and so we just decided to part ways on that one two weeks before we were supposed to close. It yeah. sounds like a smart no. I mean, why are you beating yourself up over it? It's 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 easy to look at sunk costs. Like we probably spent twenty, thirty thousand to get to that point of yeah. time and real dollars with attorneys and bank and trips to Dubai and all of those things uh to get to that place. And um you know, after doing three deals, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I can do this, uh, and I'm going <laughs> yeah. to muscle it. You, I got up to bat and hit it out of the park three times. Ah, this is a piece of cake. I'd take any swing and I'll mm -hmm. hit it. It's going to mm -hmm. be a base hit. Yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And So I, I'm not beating myself up over it. It's just there's a, there's an emotional come down and, and re Yeah, re no, restart. it's the same thing with, like, uh, startup failures, you know? Mm -hmm. Didn't work out. Like a mm -hmm. lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. And I just remember reading this article for a uh, long time ago about uh, Tony Robbins. He was, he, you know, helps a lot of CEOs and he just, mm -hmm. one of the reasons is, Hey man, you just got to recover faster. Mm. Good point. Uh, yeah. Good point. And take, th take your lumps. Yeah. And get you over take your it. lumps and go, just get back on the horse. Let's go. Yeah. Right. But Jordan, thanks for sharing that. Really appreciate that. Yeah, cheers, John. So w what's next on this? Aside from your, I mean, acquisitions in the same industry because they're fragmented, you're also taking your operating expenses, tournament or profit center. Mm -hmm. are, are you just going to be buying bigger things or, you know, I mentioned in Syracom, they're a big player in the market in Tucson mm -hmm. and Phoenix market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we've got a long ways to go. I, I, I'm having a lot of fun. And I think that's important. And it, it's given me the lifestyle and professional creative opportunity that I, I, I love. I get to work with amazing team members. Um, and so I, the path for me is continue to be an operator. I, I think I add the most value being the operator. Yeah. Uh, we'll reassess in a couple of years. But, um, and then the other thing is I'm having a lot of fun with Hire Globo, the, the business we spun off. Because it's truly transformational for it's been a secret sauce for our roll up to amplify our cash flow and get that flywheel going by. Yeah, is that a completely different a company separate from yours, or is it under the uh, same umbrella? It's a it's a it's a totally different entity, different team. But I'm the common link. Uh, 
It's called Higher Globo. And uh, what kind of revenue know, is that doing now? We're on pace for a million ARR. Yeah. Hey, okay. And so it, it's it, we've done every role from like controllers, operational leaders, uh, down to you know VAs, executive assistant. Um, so professionally, it's it's higher globo. It's continue on the M and A path with language network roll up. Uh, maybe we'll exit at some point, and somebody else that has an appetite to take it even further and do even bigger deals. I think that would be a private equity buyer, or there's some strategic strategic buyers in our industry where now we're getting are, to the are size. Are you giving them the indi- invitation to contact you through Erica? <laughs> 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 they they contact me, they, but it's it just at this size, like why uh, I'm having fun and yeah. uh, like, let's grow it a well, little bit Well, what they're going to say is, you know what, uh, Jordan, we want you to have fun. We're, we're just going to buy 60% <laughs> of the company and you run it for another five years, but you can put a lot more yeah. money in the pocket right now. Yeah. I, I, no offense. There's just a lot of dumb money out there. Um, like if I partner with somebody, like I want to have more fun, like you said, and they bring a skill set that truly helps us go to the next level. I've seen too many right. guys, you know, come up with some name and put up a website and say, you know, what we're whatever capital. Um, but it's like, you guys, the money here is, is an operator. You guys need an operator. Um, and, uh, I hard I to find your, those are the yeah. hardest things to find. Yeah. Yeah. So I won't say never, John. Um, and it's just it's just too fun right now. And I would encourage people to look at fragmented service businesses. As yeah, a that's like everybody's chasing HVAC, plumbing, electrical, because everybody else is chasing it. It's like a yeah, yeah. But go, but go more niche, like professional, yeah. technical, scientific services. Um, I think there's you know an amazing one that does. Um, like toxic testing or like there's certain regulations in some states that require your building to have this annual testing. I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's just so niche. There's so many of these like little uh, non home services um, industries that the demand's never going away because it's uh, because of compliance or regulation. Yeah. And most of the time you get a guy who operates it because they were the technician originally. Same thing. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. a, a, a same duplication of the story of your parents. Like they, their heads down. They're they're building the business. They don't put systems in place. They don't think about growing this to a hundred million dollars, right? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Jordan Evans, thank you so much. The accidental roll up entrepreneur. Yeah, you just gave I, me an idea sticks. for my uh, YouTube thumbnail. That sticks, John. I, <laughs> It's appropriate. <laughs> thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for putting out great content. I love listening in, and it's just it's so fun to do this with you. All right. I'm going to stop. <laughs>